It's time for Remodel Revolution. And now, an award-winning contractor with over 40 years experience. Here is Alex Guthrie. Episode number 166 of Remodel Revolution. This is the podcast series. We're coming to you live from deep in the heart of the great state of Texas, from the world headquarters of Remodel Revolution, down in the bowels, the de the, the dungeons where they keep us. <laughs> I'm your host, Alex Guthrie. I hope you're having a great day. Um, we're going to have a fantastic show today. We're, we are going to have a lot of fun. We have a very good friend of ours of the show, Mr. Andy Armstrong from Fujitsu General America. They are the air conditioning company. They're huge. Um, and we're, uh, he's going to join us in just a few minutes. We're also going to talk about, um, do you think it's a good idea to have your designer act as your general contractor? I keep running into this lately on a couple of different projects and have you know run into it over the years several times. And um, I think it's a good discussion to have because it, it sometimes works out fine and sometimes it doesn't, just kind of like all things. But for, uh, for uh, first, today, we're going to introduce our guest, Mr. Andy Armstrong from Fujitsu. Uh, he's coming to us on Zoom, so we're doing kind of a split screen deal. Hello, Andy. You need to hit your microphone, bud. <laughs> There we go. There you are. Start that way. That's better. You know, you, it looks funny when you're just kind of talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have my subtitles going. Yeah, so right. Better hit the mute button. So, so how are? Hey, it's great to be with you, Alex. Thanks, thanks. It's good to be with you again. And we we did a show. Uh, Andy and I did a show. I I don't know a year or so ago, and it was really a lot of fun. And and Andy really knows his stuff. He uh, he is the uh, vice president of general marketing is that right andy yeah sales and marketing sales and marketing. North america yeah. yeah and so uh andy called me and he said alex i've got some new stuff that's happening in air conditioning and andy take it away and tell us what's going on in the ac world well before i dive into that i want to thank you for our first opportunity to talk because it was a so much fun just talking about the fujitsu stuff but being a, uh, a, a DIYer and uh, remodeling my own home, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing and the message you're taking out to the public. So I, uh, I listen and learn, and uh, it's good to be a part as uh, the AC guy, but uh, it's equally important to hear what you guys are doing and really appreciate all the, all the good uh, episodes that you do. Well, so, thanks so much. I appreciate that. But as far as uh, ductless, it's, uh, it's in our place, we talk about the ductless revolution, which uh, I know that uh, fits in nicely with the remodel revolution. But there's uh, so many things happening in the, in the uh, market of HVAC today. Uh, customers are wanting better zoning. They're wanting better temperature control. They're wanting better uh, efficiency. They're better, wanting quieter systems. And ductless solves all those problems. So we're very excited to be offering more and robust solutions around that front. Uh, which include uh, devices that can handle more air, more move more air through the house. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to put more boxes in. So uh, meaning uh, have one outdoor unit with as many as, as uh, nine or 10 indoor uh, heads uh, to match up with whatever the load is in the house. So it's really customizing based on what each homeowner needs and what they want in their home and how their lifestyle fits. So you also uh, have a variance to the uh, ductless or, or the system where they all have a cassette that's on the wall. So when you, when you walk into the room, you see an air handler that's on the wall, typically, is how these have, have worked. And now I'm about to do a porch where I'm converting a, a screen porch to an air conditioning area. And we're uh -huh. using a, what he, my AC guy calls a cassette, where it actually yes. just sits up in the attic. There's no duct. There's no nothing on the wall because my client didn't want to see that. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to take you on a little tour right here and show you one right above my uh, left there shoulder. There it is. Yeah. yeah. You can see a cassette. And in this case, it's hanging in a suspended ceiling. Uh, but that's one of your options is to give that type of solution and uh, in a... Uh, uh, sunroom or a, 
uh, attic space or a garage. It's just a very easy solution to get that product to, uh, to the space and it attaches just like your wall mount unit would. Uh, very easy to get in there, out of the way, inauspicious. It's perfect for it's control. perfect for the small uh, small space. That's what we were the solution we were looking for. We wanted something in a small space that didn't take up a lot of room, and that is it. Just looks like a regular vent up on the ceiling. Yeah, we we certainly have that option. The other option, if you look right above my head here, I'll tilt it up a little bit. But that is a more traditional ducted air handler, and that will also attach to the. Uh, the mini split ductless solution. So you have the ability to use the cassette we just showed. You can use a wall mount unit. You can use something in an attic space or a closet and hide it just like you would a traditional ducted system. But we can do that and move the refrigerator around the house and the little refrigerant tubes that are tiny and you don't need all that duct work taking up space in your attic or your uh, basement. You're just moving the, the small refrigerant lines through. So your efficiency is far greater with these systems the way that i don't know if it's the system or or explain that to us because the sear ratings are so high on these how how does that happen there's a couple of things happening there alex the the first and most important is it's just really good technology uh they've uh, uh, maximized the efficiency of the coil and anytime you're doing heating air conditioning it's about heat transfer what are you doing on that coil surface to move heat away and do so efficiently so there's great design in the coils the second piece is inverter technology. And inverter technology is, a, to, to make it very simple, so we take that signal coming out of your electrical outlet, which is typically AC, or it varies up and down like a sine curve. Uh, what we do is we convert that to a DC signal, and then we're able to take that DC up and down based on how much cooling you need in the space at the time. Or how so much you're, con you're controlling the amount of energy that you're using. Exactly, and mm -hmm. only putting enough energy in to give you just the amount of heating and cooling you want. So you're not, uh, imagine if you could only drive your car 60 miles an hour or zero, wouldn't be terribly efficient. Right. Uh, so what we're able to do is, is if you are a 75 degree day and it's just a little warm in the house, we just turn on that air conditioner a little bit, give you a little bit of cooling and make it a lot more comfortable. I'm really Another, interested in the uh, in the. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm really um, interested in the idea that you can add multiple units onto a single condenser. Can you explain that to us? Absolutely, absolutely. There's two different ways to do that. The traditional ductless units will actually have uh, up to five connection points on the side of the unit, so you can run five different set of uh, what we call line sets. They're basically copper tubes going into the house with your refrigerant. And then each tube will bring just the heating or cooling to that space that's needed at the time. So uh, most so of each, us- So each room has its own individual air control? Exactly. Wow. Uh, either a remote control or a wall mounted control. And then you can set that temperature where you want it. So most of us live in two, three, 4,000 square foot, whatever size home you have, but we don't live in the whole house all the time. We're living in, you know, three, four, 500 square foot at a time. So if you're able to shut the rest of the house down or at least uh, uh, cut it way back, that really just adds to your overall efficiency, which isn't even calculated into our SEER. Well, and, that's, and that's different from times past when we always told people not to do that for years. We said, don't shut rooms off and don't shut vents off because your system, your normal or, you know, the, the old type forced air system was actually designed to be efficient by running the whole house, not part of the house. Well, and, and if you think of basic fan technology, uh, if you're blowing 2000 uh, uh, CFM into a home, uh, you need to have somewhere for that air to go. And your, your motor is gonna greatly reduce its life, if not its efficiency, uh, by trying to blow air into spaces that are blocked off. So, so our traditional mm -hmm. story, you're absolutely right, Alex, mm -hmm. we told homeowners, don't turn it off no matter what, don't right. shut it down, <laughs> uh, because it's gonna kill your unit. And uh, it would really shorten the life. Now we're designing systems around that. We're saying, hey, if you only need one room going, we're only going to turn that compressor and, and fan on to handle that one room. So we greatly reduce your wear and tear on the unit. We greatly reduce your energy use. We greatly reduce the noise level. So a big benefit for all homeowners when, yeah. we're, when we're able to do that. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I always had people blocking rooms off and calling me and saying, hey, I you know, my, my AC bill is so high. And I go, well, your, your AC bill 
is high, but now you're going to have a repair bill. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get worse. So it's kind of like, um, the, so to explain it to our listeners, it's sort of like air in needs to equal air out. And it's, it's, it's almost like, I, I want to say blowing up a balloon, but it's not even quite like that. When you let the air out of a balloon, <clears throat> excuse me, all the air is coming out of this little bitty hole in the end of it. And that's what makes all the noise. It's because it's having to force its way out. It's the same uh -huh. thing with the air conditioning system. So you have return air. So you force air in and the return air pulls, needs to pull an equal amount of air out for it to be efficient. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a, a bit of a confusion. It, it, it seems logically that you could just blow cool air into a home and that would, that would solve the problem. But the reality is we're doing two things when we cool. Uh, one is we're lowering the temperature, which, which you could certainly do blowing cold air in, into the house. But the more important piece is we're taking humidity out. And that requires to get that return air back into a system so you get good circulation and you're always wringing that extra moisture out of the space. Uh, we found uh, in multiple studies in our industry that if, if you take the humidity out properly, uh, people are a lot more comfortable at higher temperatures. So you don't need as much cooling if you're doing the proper job of airflow and dehumidification. And the only way to do that is get the air that's in the space in that container of your home to go through the airflow device and suck that moisture right out of it. And of course it does other things as well, like f it filters the air because mm -hmm. uh, now with these tight homes that we're building, uh, more energy efficient homes, that's become a critical factor as well. Yes, and that, that's another topic that uh, uh, we uh, need to make homeowners aware of as, as we get these homes tighter and tighter. It's equally uh, important to look at how we get fresh air into the house. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, with VOCs and all the, the bad things that we breathe inside the home without any fresh air, it will make uh, homes and the people in them sick, and that's not a good solution. So, so how do we do that with a ductless air system? Are we using a traditional method or is there anything different you do to, to get that fresh air in? That's a, a great question, Alex. And it's a good one to talk to your contractor about because there's multiple methods. Uh, in the more extreme climates, we look at air exchangers, which are basically devices that bring in fresh air and run it through a heat exchanger uh, as they exhaust air. So you're sucking the efficiency out of the, the already conditioned indoor air to make for a more efficient way to bring fresh air in. In less extreme cases, you can just bring fresh air dampers in where you're actually supplying fresh air into the space, a very small amount all the time to get you the air changes. Uh, quite often in older homes, the leakage rate is so great <laughs> that uh, we really don't need to add any more. But right. it, it's, yeah. Well, and of course, you're, of course we know that your, uh, your carpeting is your best air filter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does catch a lot of the... Uh, the bits and pieces flowing through the air. Well, a lot of, a lot of, I tell my clients, if you see, if in my listeners, if you, if you see uh, dust around air conditioning vents up and like you have a vent in the ceiling and you see a dark area around it or where it's, where the air is blowing out on the ceiling, you see a bunch of dust collected. What's that telling mm -hmm. them? That's telling you two things. One, that your airflow might need some adjustments. Uh, but more importantly, that your filter needs to be changed. There mm -hmm. shouldn't be things coming out the supply side of your air conditioner. So when you hold up that tissue to any vent in your house and air is blowing out of it, that means it's a supply vent. And if there's dust around that vent, that means that there's dust in your duct system. And that happens because the filter is not being changed on a regular basis. And uh, in the case of a lot of the older homes, sometimes that's because you'll have a duct in your attic. Now down south here, we put a lot of our AC ducts in the attic. And, and sometimes those things, will, the return air will become loose and it'll actually be drawing air in from the attic, which is old dusty, dirty air and broadcasting it back through the system. And it shows up in places like, like the ceiling or, or, you know, in the carpet where you're vacuuming it and you're going, why is it always so dusty in here? And that's mm -hmm. why. Yeah, and that, that really speaks to a much bigger problem, too. In older homes in those markets, most, most contractors now are doing a very nice job of installing good duct systems in those attics, but it's not unusual for that attic to be 130 degrees. So not only do we want it sealed in terms of its ability to suck that dust into the system, but we also want it sealed and insulated so we're not losing all the efficiency of that cooling system just because we're putting air into a 130-degree attic. So attention to those ducts in the attic is crucial. Yeah, And uh, is, yeah. Uh, the materials used 50, even five years ago 
uh, in flex duct and duct board in, in that Texas market especially, uh, don't hold up as well as some of the manufacturers thought they might. So it's always good to inspect that, bring your contractor in, make sure he's helping you to make the good decisions on how to make your system most efficient. Well, the, the, the 130 degree attic <laughs> can, it could tear up a whole lot of stuff. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm in them all the time, or I, at least I look in them. I send other people. <laughs> <laughs> Wise <like>. choice. <laughs> well, um, one of the uh, things I was going to tell you is that I have, fr you know, there's a, a big uh, uh, market right now for tiny homes. And a lot mm -hmm. of there's manufacturers down here building these tiny homes, and they're they're uh, the maximum square footage is 400 square feet. Sounds small, but it, you know it's pretty livable. And mm -hmm. they're foaming the walls, floors, and ceilings. They're totally encapsulating these things in foam, and they're using your systems to for the air control. And I actually have a couple of friends that have them, and I tell you, it's really really efficient. It doesn't cost anything to run that air conditioning in the summer no it's, it's kind of fun on those small applications to look at the systems we put in there and just watch the amp draw right? yeah. in, in the <laughs> hottest days of the year and you're you're looking at what used to be a couple of light bulbs doing all your cooling you're saying wow this technology <laughs> has changed a lot and uh they're perfect applications for that type product because we can we can heat and cool that space easily but most importantly we can do it quietly uh, in a small space like that, it's encapsulated, you're going to hear most everything. So you need a quiet system on the wall making you comfortable. Well, that is absolutely correct. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I did, I uh, converted an air, well, I built a man cave in an airplane hangar for a guy. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's pretty awesome. It's on my website. Anybody wants to see it, it was pretty, pretty neat. And um, of course, we used a, a ductless air system in there. And one of the things that uh, impressed us first and foremost was how quiet it is. So you have that, so if you have the cassette that's on the wall when you walk in, the main thing that is strikes you first is you don't hear it. You can't even tell if it's on most of the time. Yeah, that, that's uh, very true. And the other piece of that that's amazing to me is um, because we use lower air velocity, uh, Sometimes you don't even know it's on if you walk by it because it's not just blowing air down the back of your neck. It's actually just gently pushing the air through the space, getting that return air to come back through. And most of the time you're able to do that pretty effectively. Uh, so both the noise level and the, the airflow or the draftiness just goes away. You're just comfortable and don't realize something's happening behind your back. So I have a question. Now, they just passed uh, some new codes in California that require solar panels on houses. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's fantastic, honestly. I love the idea. I would love to see us have a completely uh, carbon neutral energy system. Maybe someday in my grand grandchildren's lifetime that'll happen. But anyway, um, your system seems to me like it would lend itself to that, that type of energy source. Yeah, we pay a lot of attention to that, Alex, and we're, we're working with the government and utilities to make sure that we're producing systems and training contractors to install and, and be in that carbon neutral space. Um, the, our heat pumps now are able to heat across the entire United States and uh, make people comfortable at all temperatures. You, you, you think of a heat pump and uh, traditionally we tell homeowners that the heat pump's great because it will take heat out of the outdoors and bring it indoors and even the coolest coolest winters and now we're able to do that with our products down to negative 20 degrees so wow um, it it, it uh, makes carbon carbon neutral or carbon free homes very very feasible uh, in, in the future here we obviously have to work on the the grid and make sure we get uh, better sources and California's solar panels is one solution there we we sell a uh, tremendous number of ductless products in Canada where they use a lot of hydro and uh, electric is very cheap in the winter because it's all coming from those, those dams they built up north. Uh, but we have a dominant position up there because we can heat so well. And if we can keep the Canadians warm, I'm pretty sure we can do pretty well with the, the <laughs> yeah, US I mean, folks. If you can keep them happy, you're keeping everybody happy, that's for sure. Andy, exactly. I so, so appreciate you coming on and spending time with us today. It's been really a lot of fun. Um, Let's do this again, and we'll. We've, I know that there's more changes coming in the in the uh, 
AC business, like like the new coolants that they're introducing and making you guys use stuff like that. I want to do a conversation about that when we uh, next time we visit. And we really appreciate your time this morning. It's always fun and always educational. Thank you so much. Uh Happy to be here, Alex. And uh, anytime, just say the word. I'll uh, I'll be in the remodel revolution anytime. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it so much. That's Andy Armstrong with Fujitsu General America. Andy uh, all, is always fun to talk to. Always has a whole lot to to do. Well, if you looked at the uh, uh, Facebook page today, you noticed that the person that I had as a guest, and I'm just going to dig in it a little bit, didn't show up today. So, uh, okay, Matt Mitchell. Um, I don't, I'm, I don't want to call anybody out, you know, nothing. <laughs> Ziggy's over there going, where is he? I, I think you're calling him out right now, <laughs> as a matter of fact. <laughs> so, uh, let's do a, let's do a remodeler's tip today. It's brought to you by Total Air and Heat, my go-to heating and air conditioning company. Um, listen, in case you haven't noticed, summer is about to turn into fall and that lasts about three days in north texas <laughs> at the most uh, as soon as the butterflies are gone <laughs> so is the cool weather and then it gets cold and between now and eh, thanksgiving your air conditioning will be going from heat to cool to heat to cool and a uh, hundred different times and so it's really important that you have your air conditioning system serviced so that it can accommodate you and not go down at the wrong time. Because right now everybody's like, oh, my air conditioning, I was in a house yesterday, somebody's like, well, my air conditioning went out and we had to get it done over the weekend. That That's really, really unfortunate when it's 100 degrees outside. So you need to call my friends at Total Air and Heat, Steve Lawton and Justin, his son, run this company and have, they're the third generation, well, Justin is, they've been here over oh, almost 65 years. They're like pioneers in central air and heat systems. They're super quality folks, just, just awesome guys. Their people are trained, their background checked, they are busy enough, they're not going to come in there and try and upsell you on stuff, they tell you if something's wrong and what to what they need to do to fix it, you can always trust their judgment. You can contact them at totalair.com or give them a call at 866-483-0958, 866-483-0958, and tell them Alex made you do it. So give my friends at Total Air and Heat a call. So let's talk about should you... Or do you really think it's a good idea to let your designer be your contractor? Now, I've been on this kick for a while, not with designers specifically, but with basically all these people that are coming in and saying they're remodelers slash painters slash plumbers slash whatever. Uh, my experience in this industry is that I want to find people that spe uh, specialize in, in the trade that I need them for. And I do that because people that kind of know a little bit of everything don't always know the right things for a certain problem that you're going to face. So let's talk about some of the things that have to happen when you're remodeling or let's say a kitchen or a den or whatever it is. So typically, um, someone will go to a designer and, the, and ask the designer to help them make decisions on colors and fabrics and finishes and things like that. And it, that's fantastic because I'll tell you, I don't know very many contractors that are, that are qualified to do that or everybody's house would look like a workshop. So... <laughs> We want to, we, we love designers. We love designers, but we really like people that understand how to get things done correctly. And that is not always a designer's strength. And I'm not, I don't mean to pick on them. It could be anybody, it could be your next door neighbor. If they're not an experienced contractor, then getting things done correctly can be a real problem for you. And I want to give you an example. I've got a friend, she's having her house remodeled, uh, part of her house, her kitchen and living area. And 
she has a designer that has come in and done a bunch of work and then she asked me to come over and look at it and I was kind of well let's say a little bit ticked off at some of the things I saw and some and some of it had to do with things that were just not being done right they weren't being done correctly um little issues like fire hazard issues or plumbing issues little things like did they put air filters over the return airs like i keep telling people to do to to filter the air while you're doing a remodel um, plasticking off or petitioning off the part of the house you're not working in so you're not introducing a bunch of dust all over the place these are things that weren't being done also just installing uh, a certain sink a certain way it wasn't done correctly there was all of these things that i was looking at that were really kind of aggravating me because not that i wanted to be her contractor because i don't because i love her too much <laughs> but because i want it done correctly and i keep running into this now uh, another designer that uh, i worked with years ago she would have me come in and other people come in and give her quotes and then she would have her retired husband go in and do the work and not give us the job and i'll tell you that is really uh, a pretty unethical thing to do but also i had a couple of her clients call me a couple of years later and say we're not going to let her back in the house we want you to come back and do more work for us and so it's not always a, a good idea to have people that aren't qualified in there doing work because I don't know if they're trying to just make it easy on everybody or they're just trying to make extra money I get all that everybody likes to make a little bit of extra money but listen it's your it's a big investment regardless it's an investment in your emotions it's an investment in your time so let's talk about a few things that have to happen to uh, make a job successful management is a big part of it and so when I, when I go in and as a contractor and I hire people to work on your house they're responsible to me and I'm responsible to you the homeowner if I'm not coming in in that capacity if you're just calling random people to come in and work on your house this happens all the time all the time I just got finished with a project I worked on for about eight or nine months the homeowner had been calling people from uh, Craigslist and hiring them to work on his house. This is before I got there. <laughs> and we had to go back in and repair tons and tons of things that were done wrong. They just simply were not qualified. And the homeowner was acting as his own contractor, and he wasn't qualified to do that. So he didn't know. He got, they did the work. He paid them, and they disappeared when we called them to come and fix it. And so there's a, there's a management part of this that's critical to the success of a remodel project. No remodel project is cheap. None of it's cheap. And if you do it wrong, if you cut corners, if you don't pull a permit when it needs to be pulled, things like that, then you can get yourself in a lot of trouble, and it's a whole lot more expensive fixing it the second time, trust me. And it's, it's hard finding people that will even do it. Uh, I'm very particular about that because there's lots of liability these days. You know, everybody's everybody's got a trigger finger and have their they have their attorney's phone number on speed dial. So we, we don't want to go there. Also, I want to talk about uh, this permit issue because it came up with me on a project because I didn't think I really needed a permit to do it. It was a cosmetic uh, little project that I was doing. And then the, one of the um, vendors, uh, the mechanical guy, said, you know, we really need to permit this AC. And I said, fine. And we went down and we permitted the job. Uh, it's not that I'm anti-building permit, but sometimes when you're just doing cosmetic repairs, you just don't really need them, I don't think. But it, it doesn't mean an inspector's not going to walk up on your job site and shut you down and tell you to go get a permit. I've had that happen. And... Uh, when I went down to get the permit, the city asked me what I was getting the permit for. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> he, told me, he told me to get one. And uh, that was a whole new, a whole different ordeal. So you need to kind of have people out there that understand these processes. 
and understand how to deal with them when they come up because all kinds of things come up. Lately, we've been dealing with a lot of people that are hiring folks and they are not um, experienced. So let's say you hire a person that says he's a roofer and a remodeler. Now there's some really good quality companies that are roofers and remodelers. I get that. I, I truly do. I'm not trying to beat everybody up. But I would be very careful about just finding the cheapest guy driving down the street in his pickup truck with a magnetic sign on it that says roofing remodeling or painting remodeling, whatever it is. Check them out thoroughly. Uh, these, are, these are usually, they're small operators. And sometimes their version of remodeling is not uh, exactly what you were expecting. Like you don't want the guy that just put your roof on to come in and <laughs> remodel your bathroom. It's not always a good idea <laughs> to have them do that. So sometimes what they mean by remodeling might be if they're working on the roof and, the, and you've got water damage to the eaves of the house or rotted siding or things like that, kind of rough stuff that needs to be fixed. Sometimes that's what they're meaning by remodeling. Just because somebody says they're in construction, it doesn't mean they're going to make a good contractor and come in and be in charge of your $100,000 to remodel your house. It's just, uh, it, there, it needs to be done with a lot of care and you need to give it a lot of thought um, about who you hire. I want to, uh, I want to uh, let's talk about uh, foundations. Now we've just gone through a very um, dry period here in North Texas. And your ground, uh, well, we, we keep having some rain. It's wetter than it, it normally is. It's actually September and it's still green in most of the areas I see. And I'm not used to seeing that having uh, been born and raised here. It's normally brown this time of year and there's grass fires and all kinds of stuff. But Hey, this year it's it's a little wet, but let's talk about your foundation. And we had Randy Hargrave on a couple of weeks ago, and Randy and Chris Vaughn, and um, we, you know, I'm particular about the foundation repair because I've seen so many scams, and I know we all hear about it, and we all see it from time to time, and that's why I hire Hargrave and Hargrave Foundation. Now, one of the things that I really like about them is they have a they use helical piers. And helical piers are like a big giant wood screw that goes in the ground, but it goes really deep and it goes really into really hard, hard soil or rock. And it's a lot, it doesn't disturb the dirt around it as much. And so you don't have these big loose voids under your house like you would have if somebody dug a big giant pier and filled it with concrete. And so uh, I really like this pier. I also like the system because when we're, you can take it to the center of the house. Let's say you're remodeling a house and you need to lift the floor up in the middle of the house inside. You can actually take these helical piers and they take a little boom, it goes inside the house, it drills this pier down and then you can, you can secure the foundation in the middle of the house. Now that's a whole lot easier than what we used to have to do which was cut a big chunk of, <laughs> a big chunk of uh, foundation out and get in there and hand dig it. You don't have to do that anymore. So give Hargrave and Hargrave Foundation Repair a call, Hargrave and Hargrave Foundation Repair.com. Uh, give them a call at 972-442-3415. Contact them at Hargrave at Hargrave Foundation.com and uh, get a free quote if there's nothing wrong, they will tell you there's no need for them. They're not going to come out and just run it up on you. They're really good, honest guys. So give them a call. So with that in mind, I want to talk about foundations for a minute. And I want you to check your foundation. This is our builder's tip today. We want you to check your foundation. Walk around the outside of your house. And if you, we've had rain recently, kind of little spotty storms. Some of us got it, some of us didn't. If you see standing water, if you've been, even of course, if you've been watering your yard and you see standing pools of water or puddles of water around your foundation, then you probably have a low spot 
and you probably need to throw some dirt in there or somehow get that water where it will move away from the foundation. I know it's dry. Uh, you may have a little gap between the dirt and the foundation of your house, you know, maybe an inch or so because the, the ground shrinks when it gets dry, but that's okay. That's normal. But if, you're, if you see standing water, we want the water to go away from the foundation, you know, 12, 15 inches. We don't want it standing there because then what it'll do there, it'll actually absorb down. It'll, it'll swell that dirt up in that one spot. And then you're going to have a crack right or some sort of movement right there. So we want the foundation, all, the dirt all the way around the foundation to be actually sloped away a little bit. Also, this time of year, in the fall, a lot of times we'll go through and do a bunch of pruning, getting ready for next spring. Some of the plants that uh, people are planting around their houses are really detrimental to their foundation because the root systems will go under the foundation and they'll suck water out and they'll create a dry spot under that foundation. So, and some of them will go under 30, 40 feet. I mean, it's not just a couple of inches. So you need to look at those. You can put barriers up. Excuse me. You can put barriers up um, that a root barrier that will go along the foundation, on the front of the foundation, and it will prevent those roots from going any further. It can't go under the foundation. So if you have a lot of plants, a lot of uh, ornamental plants around the house, and you're seeing some kind of foundation movement, or you can't keep your foundation, you know, tight right there, you see a lot of movement in it, it might be a good idea to check and get a foundation company out there, get Hargrave out there and see if you need to put a root barrier up around that foundation. Um, that can really help a lot. And on the same token, we don't want it to be too sloped. <laughs> we want what the, the whole idea here is that we want to control the amount of moisture around your foundation. A lot of water uh, messes with foundations from the roof. It falls off the roof. It goes e either the gutters are overflowing or there's no gutters. I see a lot of that. Um, make sure your gutters are cleaned out. Make sure that when they come down the wall, the downspout that comes down the wall is actually projecting the water out away from the foundation. I have houses where it dumps straight down and it creates a big old problem, maybe right in the corner of a room or somewhere. You'll see, you'll see it where it just dumps water right at the bottom of the foundation. Not a good idea. You want the water to go out away from the foundation or into a, uh, a, a drainage system that would go around the foundation. So if that gutter uh, downspout's coming straight down, it might want to go into a drain, uh, drain that's picking that water up and taking it away. And that's fine. Again, we want consistency with the moisture. So uh, this time of year, you would also want to be watering around your foundation. So you'd water 10, 15 minutes a day, not a day, but uh, two or three times a week. You just have to kind of check and see how it's working for you. If you have a, a sprinkler system, usually you can control those heads where they'll water you. And listen, make them walk spray away from the house. Uh, we deal with houses all the time that have rot issues and mold issues because the sprinklers are spraying up against the wall. Get your, they, they make sprinkler heads, it'll spray away, and you, want it, you don't want it to be so high off the ground that it's hitting windows. You know, really look at how your sprinkler system's working. If you're having a lot of issues with dryness around your foundation, you can get soaker hoses, and soaker hoses work fantastic. They're not real expensive, and they're a lot cheaper than fixing your foundation. So put a soaker hose about 10 or 12 inches away from the foundation, all the way around the house, and run it. Uh, you, you don't try and do it all at one time. I've done that, and I had a design. <laughs> actually flooded my house because I let it run too long. So don't do that. Uh, run it 15, 20 minutes, and if you need to do that every day for... Uh, five or six days till you get that moisture level built up a little bit and that ground swollen back up a little bit, then, then that's going to work just fine. And then you can cut it back to two or three times a week or whatever it takes, depending on the weather <clears throat> and the dryness of the weather. 
So uh, check your foundations, get them ready, because if we hit a wet season, which we may or we may not, we never know around here, but if we hit a wet season, we want to make sure everything's right to handle the water that we're going to get. If we don't have a wet season, we have a cold, dry winter, we want to make sure that everything's being properly maintained to get us through to the next wet season. So it's sort of playing that game as we go. Um, uh, if you're thinking about a new garage door, I want you to give Windsor a look. Look at Windsor Door. Go to their website, windsor.com, and look at what can be done these days with a garage door. Now, if you think about it, your garage door is about the largest door on your house. Well, it's definitely on most houses the largest door on the house, but it's one that you see from the street or various parts of the neighborhood. You can see those garage doors. That It's really important that that door looks good. One of the things that you can do with garage doors now is we can make them actually uh, hurricane-proof. They've got a hurricane-proof garage door. They've got garage doors. The openers that they use are really amazing. Uh, the opener is a Wi-Fi controlled opener, and you can open it or close it from anywhere really literally in the world if, as long as you have your cell phone with you and that's those are lift master garage door openers and those they're real advanced um, you can do a lot of different things with them probably a lot more advanced than i know you can do wood doors i have people want me to do cedar doors i have people want me to do all glass doors i've done all of them and i always use windsor door so give windsor door contact a dealer near you windsor door Dot com. I think I have that right. Yeah, windsordoor.com. Um, well, that's going to be our show today, and I really appreciate everybody being here. It's been so much fun. I really appreciate Andy Armstrong with Fujitsu spending some time with us. And thank you, Ziggy Becker, Mr. Engineer of the Year. I'm going to put in a, a, a Vote in for you, buddy. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad that we got to spend some quality time <laughs> yeah. together today without yeah. any guests getting in the way. Yeah, really? <laughs> well, he's not going to live that down. That's for sure. I'm not going to let that happen. Next week, next week we have a really good friend of ours, Richard Miller. He is a builder in Dallas, and he builds uh, uh, using building science. He uses a, an advanced framing system that makes his houses super energy efficient he builds really modern houses that that's what people are wanting right now and uh richard will be on with us i'm really looking forward to having him i hope you have a great week i'll be back next week this is alex guthrie signing off from remodel revolution you can catch remodel revolution anytime Follow the show on the website, RemodelRevolutionRadio.com, or on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, using the handle at Remodel Revolution Radio. You can always listen to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and tune in. And watch the show anytime on YouTube.